1947, when India was partitioned at independence, all motorable roads leading to Srinagar and the Kashmir Valley went through Pakistan. So in 1948, after Kashmir acceded to India, a new all-weather motorable road had to be built, connecting Srinagar to Jammu. My name is Kabir Bedi, and today on Guns and Glory, we will talk about the war that was waged to cut that crucial link that joined Kashmir to India. Tonight we talk about the second war between India and Pakistan that was fought once again over Kashmir. On the 26th of December 1963, a sacred relic went missing from the Hazrat Bal Shrine in Srinagar. The next day, the news leaked out and all hell broke loose in the Kashmir Valley. The relic, believed to be the hair from the head of Prophet Muhammad, had been stolen. Crowds went on a rampage in Srinagar. Cinema halls and property were torched. People wailed in the streets. The law and order machinery was paralyzed and curfew had to be imposed. A week later, the relic reappeared at the Hazrat Bal Shrine itself, as mysteriously as it had disappeared. But that did not quell the anguish of the Kashmiri people. Theories about politically motivated conspiracies circulated everywhere, and many doubted the authenticity of the returned relic. Throughout January, tension continued to mount in Srinagar. The incident brought the Muslim clergy into the political scene. And a holy relic committee was organized, which had both the clergy and politicians as members. Calm was restored in February 1964, when a special verification ceremony established that what had been recovered was truly the missing relic. But with the holy relic crisis having blown over, the committee virtually became a secessionist political platform much to the delight of leaders in Pakistan. Educated in Berkeley and Oxford, a young charismatic leader from Sindh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, took over as Foreign Minister of Pakistan on January 24, 1963. One of the first actions of Foreign Minister Bhutto had been to conclude the sino pak Boundary Agreement, signed on 2 March 1963. By the terms of the agreement, Pakistan ceded 5,180 square kilometers of Indian territory in Pak-occupied Kashmir to China. At that time, military dictator Field Marshal Ayub Khan was at the helm of affairs in Pakistan. Both Bhutto and Ayub were instrumental in drumming up passions over Kashmir to suit their political purpose. Across the border in India, 17 years after independence, a new prime minister had taken charge in June 1964. Lal Bahadur Shastri had been chosen by the Congress party for the top job after the death of Jawaharlal Nehru. Nobody had an inkling of the iron will that this outwardly diminutive man was to display in the days to come, least of all, the political masters of Pakistan. When passions were inflamed over the missing sacred relic in Hazratbal, Pakistan sensed an opportunity to drum up the Kashmir issue once again. Now, beyond moral support, Pakistan began helping the Secessionist Action Committee with money, material, and direction. Pakistan evolved a plan to use the Action Committee to spearhead an anti-India revolt in the valley. They called it Operation Gibraltar. This was an operation where Pakistan had sent columns, heavily you know, armed columns, along various routes into Kashmir to capture certain strategical objectives mixed with their local population and support the main offensive. When Operation Gibraltar was launched to divert the Indian Army's attention away from Kashmir, and to test their preparedness, 
Pakistan launched Operation Desert Hawk. Desert Hawk started in January 1965, with Pakistan claiming the run of Kutch and Gujarat as Pakistani territory. By April, the armies of India and Pakistan were involved in a full battle over the control of the old Kanjarkot fort. It was in this battle that Pakistan tested their newly acquired patent tanks from the US. Both sides suffered losses. Till a ceasefire was mediated by the British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, which took effect on April the 29th. But Pakistan's hostility, both along the international border and the ceasefire line, continued unabated. The number of incidents on the ceasefire line in Kashmir reached an unprecedented level in May and June. In July and August, with winter snow having receded from the high mountain passes, the fighting intensified. On 15th and 16th of May 1965, we counter-attacked and captured three of the Pakistani posts. On August 13th, Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri finally issued a stern warning to Pakistan in a radio broadcast, saying, force will be met with force. <laughs> In August, the Indian Army began taking possession of mountain passes in Kargil, Uri, and Titwal areas, through which Pakistan was pushing its invaders. On August 25th, the Indian Army launched an operation to take the most important Haji Pir Pass. Haji Pir Pass is somewhere in the center with the road running from Uri to Punch through Haji Pir. Now the capture of this bulge was of great tactical and strategical importance to the army as well as to our country. After two days of intense fighting, they had taken sunk and Haji Pir Pass lay in front of them. Major Ranjit Dayal, with only a company of soldiers, climbed the difficult hillside carrying heavy loads by night. Fire! Leaving the leading platoon to engage and distract the enemy, Major Dayal took the rest of his men to the right, climbed the western shoulder of the pass, and then rained down on the enemy from the flank. The Pakistanis were completely surprised. They left their weapons and ran down the hill to escape. By 10.30 a.m. on August 28, one para had captured the pass. By capturing this bulge, we would have captured, and which we did, the most massive dominating features in that area, which is Badori, Basali, uh, Sunk, and Point 8.7. For his gallantry and leadership in the battle, Major Ranjit Singh Dayal was awarded the Mahavir Chakra. Pakistan still did not heed Lal Bahadur Shastri's warning. They thought the situation was ripe to escalate Operation Gibraltar and move on to the third phase of their plan, Operation Grand Slam. Its objective was to cut off all of Jammu and Kashmir north of Jammu town. They planned a surgical strike through the Chamb Akhnur sector, aiming for the all-important Jammu Srinagar Road, which ran closest to the Pakistan border in this region. Pakistan launched their attack in the early hours of September the 1st, 1965. At 3.45 a.m., Pakistan began shelling Indian Army positions in Chum. Then, 70 tanks and two Pakistani brigades rolled over the international border. The Pakistani objective was Akhnur Bridge over the river Chenab to cut off supply lines between Punjab and Kashmir. The bridge connected Jammu with Rajori and Punch, and to the east lay the bigger target of the Jammu-Srinagar Highway. 
the chief of army staff, General Jian Chaudhary, was in Srinagar and called up Prime Minister Shastri in Delhi to brief him on the situation. Later that evening, in Delhi, General Chaudhary told the Prime Minister that available resources of the army in the field would not be able to halt the Pakistani thrust. General Chaudhary was there at that time. And he came, he came back and uh, he came straight to my office. And he was saying they're very bad. And uh, could the Air Force take part? And I, I told him quite, I said, in, in our setup, the, I, don't have, I don't have authority to start a war. Prime Minister Shastri took an immediate decision. Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Arjun Singh, was told to retaliate. At 5.19 p.m. on 1st September, Indian Air Force vampires from Pathan Kot Air Force Base began taking off to reinforce India's defense. It was about uh, one hour left to sunset. And our aircraft was quite far away. They were Pathan Kot, Halwara, Adampur. And uh, attack to place at Cham Joryan Akhnu sector. That's it. Right there. You see, the main idea was to capture Akhnur Bridge. By the early 1960s, Pakistani army officers had been training in the United States and Britain. They'd also conducted joint military exercises with both countries. Pakistan had completely modernized its armed forces with new equipment from the United States, including hundreds of state-of-the-art patent tanks. Pakistan had also signed a treaty of military cooperation with China. So it was well prepared to wage a war. In Pakistan, even as his troops and armor were invading India, Ayub Khan declared in a radio broadcast that the threat of war in Kashmir was being forced on them. Over the next four days, Pakistan continued with its offensive inside India. Indian Army units, though outnumbered and outgunned, put up a brave fight. The Indian Air Force kept harassing the Pakistani forward positions from the air. Then, on September 2nd, 1965, the Pakistani Air Force also joined the battle over Cham. 7.30 in the morning, we, the Pathan Court Squadron, 23 Squadron, my brother's squadron, uh, got a warning from the radar station that four Sabre jets have got airborne and they're heading for the Cham sector. On September the 3rd, Squadron leader Trevor Keeler led a formation of NAT fighters against the intruding Pakistani F-86 Sabre fighters supplied by the Americans. As the air combat between IAF NATs and PF Sabres began, F-104 star fighters of Pakistan appeared on the scene, tilting the balance in favor of Pakistan. But in spite of being heavily outnumbered, Squadron leader Keeler went after a Sabre jet and shot it down. It happened at around about 8.30 in the morning. So it was a very historical event for us and especially for my brother also. And uh, Pakistan, of course, were extremely upset about it because the hype of the press was so intense after the aircraft was shot down. It was challenging the invincibility. By 5th September, the Pakistani armor had only managed to penetrate 29 kilometers inside India. But they had reached Jauria, a village just nine and a half kilometers from the road junction of Akhnur. In April that year, when the Pakistan army rolled their tanks into the Ran of Kutch, Indian defense planners realized that Pakistan was launching offensives in a terrain advantageous to them. On their side of Kashmir, they had better roads and a sound communication infrastructure. In Kutch, Pakistan Army installations were right next door in Sindh, while the Indian Army had to traverse vast salt plains 
to reach the border. So a plan was made secretly on how and where to attack Pakistan to render them at a strategic disadvantage. This top secret plan was codenamed Operation Riddle. General Chaudhry sought permission to launch Operation Riddle, but that meant an invasion of Pakistan. Lal Bahadur Shastri's reply was cryptic. Cross it. Before dawn on 6th September, India launched a three-pronged offensive against Lahore along an 80-kilometer front. From the northeast across the river Ravi, along the Amritsar Lahore road at Vaga, and from the southeast, attacking the Pakistani town of Kasu. Two days later, on September 8th, India opened another front, targeting Sialkot, 24 kilometers across the border. The same day, 800 kilometers south of Lahore, India opened a third front by attacking and occupying the town of Gadra in Sindh. Pakistan suddenly found itself fighting more battles on more fronts than it had planned for. The Pakistani plan of cutting off Kashmir remained unachieved, as Ayub Khan had to pull out his troops from the Chumb sector to defend Sialkot and Lahore. Pakistan made plans to counter India's Lahore offensive by launching a massive attack aimed at capturing Amritsar. Pakistan's elite first armored division was to drive hundreds of tanks through Kemkaran for the assault on Amritsar. A decisive battle was fought 60 kilometers southwest of Amritsar at Asal Uttar, thereafter known as Patan Nagar. Pakistan's pride, the first armored division, pushed its offensive towards Kemkaran with the intention of capturing Amritsar and controlling the bridge over River Bias that led to Jalandhar. But there were delays in the Pakistan attack and they got bogged down in crossing the Rohi Nala. By 10 September, the Indian army had fortified the area and was poised to meet the attack. Three Indian tank regiments had taken up a horseshoe position, while other forces blocked the flanks. Trenches had been dug, and gun positions and weapons pits had been well camouflaged by cotton and sugarcane fields. 106 mm recoilless guns were also deployed on the Kemkaran Amritsar Road. Into this valley of death came the Pakistani tanks to meet their doom. Company Quartermaster, Master Abdul Hamid of India's 4th Grenadiers was the best 106mm recoilless gun shooter in the battalion. On 10th September, when Pakistani tanks came upon the 4th Grenadier positions, Havaldar Abdul Hamid led his detachment in shooting down one tank after another. Havaldar Hamid himself, in total disregard of his own safety, destroyed three Patton tanks. Firing from his jeep-mounted RCL gun, driving right through the attacking tanks. As he was firing on a fourth tank, the Pakistanis spotted him and concentrated their fire on the brave Indian soldier. Havaldar Abdul Hamid was posthumously awarded the Paramvir Chakra the highest gallantry award in India. Pakistan's first armored division never made it past Kemkaran. By the end of September 10th, the elite division had been demolished in the battlefield of Asal Uttar, more than symbolically meaning the real answer. More than a hundred Pakistani tanks, most of them the latest patent tanks from the US, had been destroyed or captured by India. On the other hand, India lost only 12 of its own aging Sherman and Centurion tanks. Asal Uttar forced Ayub Khan to cut his losses at Kemkaran and to withdraw his armored division to reinforce Lahore and Sialkot, where the armies had been locked in combat since the 6th of September. 
As there was no natural boundary between India and Pakistan at Lahore, Pakistan had constructed the 75 kilometer long BRB, or the Bambanwala Ravi Bedian Link Canal, as protection. The three pronged Indian attack at Lahore, led by the 11th Corps, had been told to take control of this BRB canal, also known as the Ichogil Canal. The brick lined canal was 112 feet wide. 30 feet deep, with a depth of 20 feet of fast-flowing water. It ran parallel to the border, eight kilometers inside Pakistan, and the West Bank had been lined with concrete pillboxes. The first attempts by Indian forces to cross Ichugil Canal had not succeeded. Later attempts saw some units cross over, but no firm foothold could be maintained on the West Bank by the Indians. When Indian soldiers occupied a village just east of Lahore, it brought the Indian army within range of Lahore International Airport. Pakistan's counterattack across the canal could not dislodge the Indians from the East Bank. And that's how the positions remained for the rest of the war. Aim was to make a thrust towards Lahore and in Sialkot sector mainly to relieve pressure from Cham sector and in the mountain Punch, etc., that area. That was the idea. So there was never any aim to capture Lahore. In the Sialkot sector, tank battles raged for 12 days between India and Pakistan, which no one won. Over a period of three weeks, the head-on battles between the armored formations in the Sialkot sector the Ding Dong battles across the Ichogil Canal and a smaller offensive in Rajasthan created a virtual stalemate. The Soviet Union brokered a ceasefire in Tashkent, where Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri and Pakistani President Ayub Khan met over six days to thrash out an agreement. At the Senate House in Uzbekistan on 10th of January 1966, at 4.30 p.m., the Tashkent Declaration was signed to usher an era of peace between India and Pakistan. Nine hours later, Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri, who had suffered two heart attacks earlier, died in Tashkent at 1.32 a.m. The Tashkent Declaration was full of promises, but finally achieved nothing. Prime Minister Shastri died there. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and Ayub Khan had a huge falling out and turned bitter enemies. By 1969, Ayub was out of power. By 1979, Bhutto had been hanged. And five years after Tashkent, India and Pakistan were once again at war. Till we meet again on the battlefield of another war, this is Kabir Bedi saying goodbye on this episode of Guns and Glory.